It's now my, uh, my pleasure, and I'm, I'm really excited about this, to, to introduce our keynote speaker, Paul Taylor. Paul is a, a former British Na uh, Royal Navy aircrew officer, uh, an exercise physiologist, a nutritionist, a neuroscientist, and affiliate professor with the University of San Francisco. He is the director of the Body Brain Performance Institute and delivers executive performance, resilience and leadership workshops to large companies such as Medibank, NAB and Woolworths. In addition to health and fitness, Paul um, has success in leadership management and in dealing in high pressure, sorry, high pressure situations through his former roles as a, an airborne uh, anti-submarine warfare officer, a, a helicopter search and rescue crew member, and uh, has undergone rigorous uh, combat survival and resistant, resistance to interrogation training. So a really interesting background, which I, hopefully he'll uh, relate some experiences uh, this morning. Paul's work uh, emphasises the importance of leadership um, in uh, uh, ensuring a positive WHS culture and safer workplaces generally. And continually research shows us that the importance of leadership and, and getting the culture right in an organisation, I'm sure he'll be able to, to elaborate on that. So Better Work Tasmania is very much about improving workplace health and safety culture and leaderships in all levels and it's critical, critical to ensure this happens. Paul is recognised internationally, so uh, it's real, as I said, very exciting that we've got him here today. Uh, he's recognised for his work and is an example of the quality and expertise that Better Work Tasmania is bringing and will be bringing to Tasmania. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Taylor. Normally I have to nail myself to the floor, so um, I might have to do this for this. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about neuroscience. So uh, I'd like everybody just to move their chair back a little bit. You need to get your right leg free. Okay. And what I'd like you to do is just lift your right leg off the ground for me and draw clockwise circles with your right leg. All right. Make sure you're drawing a clockwise circle. Now I'd like you to lift your right hand. It's going to be your right hand right up in the air and draw a big number six in the air. Someone tell me why your leg has just reversed direction. <laughs> okay, it's a bit of a Jedi mind trick. Try that one after a few beers. It gets quite interesting. Okay, guys, I, I, I'm here to talk about um, the whole health and safety and well-being thing. But before I do, I just want to ask the question, has anybody here ever heard of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Experiment? Put your hand up if you've heard of it. Okay, we've got a smattering of geeks in the room. That's good. Um, so for those who don't know it, Hubble Hubble's obviously the most powerful telescope that we've ever created, and it is in, in Earth orbit. And one of the things that it was doing um, back in 2002, 2003, did this ultra-deep field thing. So it took a little patch of space, um, just as you can see by this red X, for those who can see the screen, um, really small patch of space, very, very far away, uh, like hundreds of millions of light years away, and they thought that it was completely empty, right? So the most powerful telescope on Earth had looked at it and said, there is nothing in this patch of space. And so for three months, Hubble, as it went around the Earth's orbit, when it got to this point, it focused on this deep field and it took photographs. And at the end of the three month period, they compiled the photographs and put them together. And what they found in this little patch of space was this. Now on this screen, there's 10,000 dots. Each dot is not a star, each dot is a galaxy. Each with over a billion stars in it. In a little patch of space, which they thought was completely empty. Now some people might be thinking they're at the wrong conference or I'm at the wrong conference right now. <laughs> but the point um, for this is about possibilism. I'm not religious, I'm a recovering Catholic. But if I was religious, my religion would be possibilism keeping your mind open to what is actually possible. Because when we don't, um, we tend to get very concrete in our thinking and we miss opportunities and new things. There is something from psychology called a confirmation bias, which is what we all have. And that is the tendency to filter information by focusing and seeking out and focusing on information that agrees with our worldview. And we tend to minimize or ignore information that disagrees with our worldview. So as you can see, if we have this confirmation bias going on all the time, as we get older, our thinking becomes more and more concrete. 
And I think that's very relevant. We miss a lot of new things and new opportunities. And I would like encourage everybody here to just park the confirmation bias under their bum for the rest of the day that you're here and interact with other people because you will learn lots of new things that you didn't, uh, didn't think about before. So that's my kind of setup for all of this. But when talking about um, safety, now safety, workplace health and safety is not my game. Workplace health and productivity is. But from a safety perspective, um, it's not really my game, but Pam, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to say is a fellow researcher and she sent me a really cool research paper on this. So this is what we call a meta-analysis. So it's someone at uh, researchers who've looked at all of the good research in a particular area and they combine that research and that's how we get some very robust research. So this meta-analysis looked at safety from a leadership perspective and the things from a leadership perspective that have a big bearing on workplace safety. And it turns out there are two main aspects of leadership um, that actually drive safety. One is transformational leadership. So this is the whole idea of an inspiring leader. And, and three out of the four components of this have a significant bearing on workplace health and safety. One is idealized influence, where you are actually um, setting an example and walking the talk, right? So it's what you do rather than what you say. Another one is, is providing inspiration. That's a, a main job as a leader, to provide certain inspiration, particularly around a safety culture. Um, culture is, is really important. It's important that a safety culture gets into the DNA of an organization. And then the third thing is individual consideration um, for your employees, actually caring about them as individuals rather than, than, than just as, as, as things that work in your organization. So that has come out of, um, from transformational leadership. And the other one is transactional leadership, which is kind of more what I think about management, right? So it is about um, monitoring people's behavior uh, around what they're doing, around, particularly around health and safety, and providing feedback. Now, sometimes feedback is, is viewed as a negative, but you've got to get it in the culture of, um, from a Kaizen perspective, from a continuous performance perspective. So it's how you provide that feedback is really important. And the third one, which is really important, particularly for a group like this, is about sharing the learnings. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my military experience around that. But this paper, when I read this paper, it actually reminded me quite a lot of the military and, and my time in the military. Now, I, I spent eight years as a, as a, a British naval officer. Um, I'm very fortunate to go through um, British officer training, which is, is highly regarded. And from that perspective, I just want to talk about my take on leadership, which is unapologetically military when I talk to organizations. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that everybody becomes a military leader, but there are things that we can learn from the military. Um, and, and to understand this, we need to understand what leadership is, right? In the military, it is about inspiring people to go into battle where they will quite possibly die, which is just a bit different than inspiring someone to stay at work until six o'clock, right? <laughs> So what can we actually learn about what the military have learned over well over a thousand years in terms of this whole idea of leadership? Well, we first need to understand the military's view of leadership. There is a very strong um, distinction between management and leadership in the military. You manage things and you lead people, right? Management is about systems and processes. Leadership is exclusively about people and about influence. Now, in the organizations I work with, um, these two concepts are very blurred. Um, and just as a few organizations who are actually starting to tease that apart, the ones who, who are um, highest in the leadership thinking. So it's kind of coming around to this idea that management and leadership are separate things. And here is the British military definition of leadership which is influencing people by providing purpose, direction, and motivation. And it goes on to say, um, to achieve the mission and improve the organization as a whole. Do you think that's a reasonable definition of leadership? Yeah, seeing quite a few heads nodding. Now, I just wanna have a look at that, um, really at that definition and see why it's important. So I'd like to do a little thought experiment. I'm a big fan of these things. Put your hand up for me if you could not run a marathon right now without stopping. Hands up. So have a look around the room, guys. The vast majority of the hands are up. I'll put, put them down. Is there anybody here who could run a marathon without stopping? Okay, put your hand right up uh, if you could. Well, uh, actually, stand up if you could run a marathon without stopping. Just so as I can see you. Can everybody please stand up? Okay. Remain standing if you could run a double marathon without stopping. 
Okay, great. So when I say marathon, you guys think double marathon. Now, here's the important bit. This is the thought experiment. I want you to think of the one person who means more to you on this planet than anybody else, apart from yourself, right? <laughs> so one person, that means if you're married with kids, you gotta choose, right? It's always lots of laughter, is that people going, I like my kids. Yeah. <laughs> if you got two kids, you gotta choose, right? Don't pretend you don't have a favorite, we're not gonna tell them. If you're Italian, you gotta choose between your kids and your mother. So I like everybody, Let's do the serious bit. Let's try and think of one person. If you can't split them, there will be people in this room. Put your hand up if you cannot split a couple of people. Okay. If you can't split them, those people who you can't split, they're all in it, right? So here's the thought experiment, and, and let's do this seriously. Think of what it would be like. Tomorrow morning, this person or these people are dead. Just sit with that. What's that feel like? Tomorrow morning, they will be dead, and nobody on this planet can do anything to save their life, apart from you. And the only way that you can save their life is you've gotta run 21 kilometers. You guys who were standing up, you gotta run 42. You gotta get a vial of medicine, and you gotta run back. Now you can run slowly, but the moment that you stop, they die, right in front of your eyes. If you make it, they live. Put your hand up if you could not run that marathon. Okay guys, look around the room. What's different? How do we have, what, I don't know, 200 people who couldn't run it, and now everybody can run it? What's different? So it's motivation driven by what? Driven by fear and love, right? Emotions, strong emotions. You get people to do extraordinary thing when they have an emotional attachment to a purpose. Yeah? The motivation, the emotion drives um, that attachment to a purpose enables people to do extraordinary things. Now this is a continuum all the way from discretionary effort to extraordinary things. The organizations I work with, I do a lot of stuff around purpose. The military have nailed purpose. I mean nailed it. Everybody who joins the military knows their purpose is to serve and protect the country, right? It is a strong emotional attachment. And what they do brilliantly is they sync someone's daily work to that overall purpose. That's what a lot of organizations miss. Either they don't have a purpose or they have a purpose that the boffins write and slap themselves on the back and the, the normal worker has no idea what it is, right? Has anybody been in a work like that? Or they have a really cool purpose, but they fail to attach their daily work to it, right? So that bit is really important. Um, and think about your whole safety culture. It's having an emotional connection to the purpose of why you're doing safety that is when you will get people to pay attention and to focus on it. But as an overall organization, the whole purpose is very important. Now the next thing that's really important is this whole idea of motivation, which is linked into purpose and emotions. Now motivation comes from the Latin word movere, which is to do with emotion. So I just wanna explore that a little bit. Um, can everybody just, I'd like you to close your eyes for me, if you will. And I'd want you to picture a lemon. Okay, just put your hand up when you can picture a lemon in your mind's eye. Just so as I know that everybody can picture a lemon. Right, I want you to describe that lemon to me. Shout it out, what's it like? So it's yellow, what else? It's oval shaped, what else? Has four wings, <laughs> somebody's might be in a gin and tonic. What else? So it's sour, right? So it's pretty sour, right? I'd like everybody to look at me. I know those guys are quite far down. I've got a lemon, and I'm going to give you a lemon to demonstrate or show you something to demonstrate what I think is really important from a leadership perspective. Mm. Jumping, Jesus. <laughs> Tazzy lemons, it would appear, are particularly sour. Now, 
Does anybody notice <laughs> mm. that they're starting to salivate a little bit? Anybody salivating? If you're not salivating, it could be one of three things. Number one, you could be autistic. Number two, you could be a sociopath. Or number three, you could be sitting there daydreaming about sex. <laughs> or potentially all of the above. Seriously, why? Why would you salivate if I'm eating the lemon? I'm eating the bloody lemon. Why are you having a physiological response? Oh, who said that? A genius boy. Mirror neurons. Okay? These are a class of neurons discovered in 1997 by Italian scientists. And they underpin empathy. Without mirror neuron system, a proper functioning one, you will not have empathy. Autistic children, autistic adults as well, have atypical, <coughs> excuse me, mirror neuron systems. <coughs> Sociopaths have a completely dysfunctional mirror neuron system. That's why they have no empathy whatsoever. Now, this is extremely important for us as humans. We have the richest mirror neuron system. Watch this. As I do that, certain neurons fire in my motor cortex in my brain, fire my nervous system, stimulate um, motor units, stimulate muscle contraction, so as I reach out and I grasp that. As you guys watch that, the same neurons fired in your brains. How cool is that shit? Seriously. Unless you're a sociopath or autistic, right? If you haven't already clicked on the link to leadership, it's that you are always on show. Always as a leader. Now, you might be sitting there saying, I'm not a leader. There are two types of leadership. There is leadership by influence and leadership by authority. Every single person that you interact with today and every single day, you influence their brains, right? From a neuroscience perspective, you influence every single person that you meet. So every single person in this room is a leader. Some people have leadership with influence and have leadership with authority as well. Does that make sense? Now, <laughs> thank you. Now, we were always told in the military that leadership is pretty simple in plain sailing. It is when the shit hits the fan that leadership becomes difficult because everybody looks to you to see how you're dealing in a crisis. Everybody also looks to you to see how you deal with mistakes. So you could see, I think, how this can transfer over into the whole culture, um, not just of your o overall organization, but the whole health safety culture and how that is linked into leadership. And it turns out that your emotions on a daily basis have a big impact on how the workplace performs, whether you are a leader by influence or um, also with authority. With authority, it's also magnified. And what we've seen from the research is that your mood will impact on three levels. Number one, it will impact individual people through emotional contagion. I bet you we all know somebody who can just light up a room, right? Who, who is very inspiring. I bet you everybody in this room knows at least one energy vampire who can suck the very life force out of you within about three minutes and kill a room dead, yep. So that is emotional contagion. We know that emotions are contagious. But we also know that your mood will influence the affective tone, which is the, the emotional tone of the entire group, right? And that then influences how they work together. Group processes, coordination, task strategy, all of this. Now, I think this will have a big impact on safety. Yep. If there is a negative vibe, people tend to be just more focused on themselves. They don't think about others. There's less collaboration. There's less sharing of ideas, all of that sort of stuff. So every single person in the workforce influences the culture, and that will have an impact upon safety. So let me tell you about, I, I spent eight years in, in, in the British Navy flying helicopters, and, and the first five years was anti-submarine warfare. So we used to chase submarines around in helicopters. Now, that's pretty dangerous because often you are 200 miles away from the near ship, right? So it's pretty dangerous stuff. We do it in all sorts of weather. But then my last three years in the military, I did helicopter search and rescue in the mountains and islands of Scotland. 
uh, which is pretty damn dangerous. Um, we take safety very, very seriously. Way back in the, in the 1940s and 1950s, in fact, there, there, was, a, there was an old instructor who told the story that in, in the early, late 1950s, early 60s, they sailed from the UK, they did a, a six-month trip over to Asia. By the time they got to Asia, half of the air crew were dead um, from accidents. So it has traditionally been the most dangerous thing. Um, they've called air, air crew are pretty crazy, right? Um, so there has been a really strong culture developed around safety in that. Um, we, every single morning, have shareholders. Shareholders came from when people would die, the next morning you'd have a meeting, and it was called shareholders because all of their belongings were divided up amongst other people, right? That's where it came from. But now our morning meetings are shareholders. Every single day you go through all of the weather, all of the engineering, and all of the safety. If there is an incident in the fleet or arm, a safety incident, it gets promulgated, disseminated across the entire fleet or arm, no matter what, it, whether it's at, at the same aircraft type or not. And there is one person in the organization whose job it is to take that information and communicate it to everybody. So when there's been an accident, absolutely everybody knows. If it's on your aircraft type, when you sign out an aircraft, you have to sign something to say that you have read the most recent safety report. So that sort of culture where we share information, and it's not about blame. If there has been, um, you go down to what the malfunction was or whether it was pilot error, and it's always shared so that everybody can learn the lessons of other people so that we can actually create the safest environment. Does that make sense? That's why I think something like this is fantastic. People coming together, sharing thoughts, sharing ideas, sharing mistakes and screw ups, um, forget about the ego, those things have got to be shared so that other people can learn your lessons because prevention is definitely better than cure. So that's from the, the fleet or arm. Now I want to take a, a, a massive jump into looking at the whole idea of presenteeism. Who's heard of presenteeism? Quite a few, actually. That, 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 that's a lot. So absenteeism we all know. For those who don't know presenteeism, presenteeism is when you're at work but you're not really there, Right? Has anybody ever been at work with a hangover in a previous job if your boss is sitting beside you? <laughs> right? You'll be aware that you're not at your sharpest, right? But that hangovers are a very small component of presenteeism. Um, we've seen a lot of research on this, and presenteeism um, is actually driven by health risks. So the more health risks an individual has, the more presenteeism, the less, the least productivity or the less productivity. So if someone has high blood pressure, that is a presenteeism risk. If they're overweight, if they've got allergies, if they've got asthma, if they're depressed, all of these things contribute to presenteeism. Uh, and there's actually been studies done on it. And Medibank Private did a big study um, in Australia a couple of years ago. And they estimated that presenteeism cost the economy $34 billion dollars. 2.7% of GDP. That's quite a lot of east-west tunnels and, all, and other things and education and all of this. And it is driven by health risks. Now, I did a bit of digging around, around the research and found stuff on actually the Safety Institute Australia around presentation and how it is underestimated in the workplace. And then this great one, which I'm happy to share, looked at, at productivity, but it also looked specifically at safety. And what came out of that is it showed that presenteeism did have an impact on safety. Um, firstly, and this was the biggest one, from cognitive function. When people aren't well, their brains don't function as well as when they are fit and healthy. Okay? Their cognition is just off. That means that your thinking, your perception, your reasoning, your judgment is all impaired. Can you see how this can lead to workplace accidents and, and safety issues? The other things is that your motor function, your ability to move um, is, is impaired, both fine and gross. So the, the little stuff and the big stuff is impaired and your coordination is also impaired. All of this leads to higher levels of incidents, near misses, higher levels of accidents, and also that decrease in productivity. So a lot of people have looked at presentation just from a productivity perspective, but it also has a big safety, health and safety connotation as well. So let me tell you, uh, let me do another skip. I am just now undertaking a PhD with the University of Tasmania, and um, it was all based on a, a clinical trial that I did with Woolworths. So 
couple of years ago, I'd done a, a bit of work with Woolworths, and the CEO at the time um, was quite concerned. They looked at all of their store managers. He had a thousand store managers, and he did my bioage testing on them, and and basically looked at their health. And the average store manager in Woolworths is borderline obese, 29.88 of a BMI, right? That is just on the cusp of obese. They had high blood pressure, they had high blood sugar, they had lots of different risks. So he wanted to do something about it. So we talked about stuff and I had I created this whole wellness platform and I convinced him to do a proper research study. So we took um, five stores in the city of Ballarat and we went and did a, a wellness intervention. And we did what's called a light touch on, on about 130 people. And then we did a heavy touch on 30 people, or sorry, 23 people. So these all had to be volunteers. They all had to be obese, that was the criteria, and they had to have serious health issues that they wanted to do something about. So for those guys, we did a two-day workshop, and, and we did some coaching and ongoing stuff, and they got lots of resources. We connected them socially, all sorts of stuff. And, and here... Um, are the results of, of what came out of the trial. So they started off, um, we did their bio age. Has anybody ever watched The Biggest Loser? Anybody admit to watching The Biggest Loser? Yeah, yeah right, there's only five people in the room who've watched The Biggest Loser. Um, I used to go on and do bio aids on that every year, and, and, and it basically takes all of your health measures and puts them into a calculator. So you can see there was a, a significant increase, 8.3 8 years bio aids lost. This is in 12 weeks, right, and which is massive. Uh, now, in The Biggest Loser House, people lost more, but I don't know if you guys know, 12 weeks in The Biggest Loser House is about 20 weeks in reality, right? Nothing is real on television. But so this is, is pretty huge. We looked at their blood, blood pressure, um, significant drop in systolic, 16.5, and significant drop in diastolic, 8.2. That is a huge change in blood pressure. Um, that's average. Right. Here we looked at they all lost about 10% of their, uh, eight, between 8 and 10% of their weight and their waist and their weight to height index, the BMI. Here you can see it in pictures for those who prefer pictures. So you can see both the males and the females um, lost significantly. Um, here is looking at something called metabolic syndrome. Anybody familiar with metabolic syndrome? So this is a cluster of conditions. Um, that basically is, is the biggest health risk. And if you have metabolic syndrome, your risk of heart disease and chronic kidney disease increases between two and 500%, right? Sorry, two to 300%. So you need three from five. High blood pressure, high triglycerides, high blood uh, glucose, low HDL, which is the protective um, cholesterol, or an elevated waist, what we call central obesity, okay? So three from five of those. When we started the study, uh, of those 23 people, um, I think 19 or uh, uh, 20 actually, 20 of them had metabolic syndrome. 12 weeks later, nobody had metabolic syndrome, right? Huge, huge impact on it. Now, I, I wanna draw the link, and here you can see the individual graphs. We didn't just do, which is my interest, we didn't just do the physical, we also did psychological measures. Um, so we looked at, um, oh, sorry, the other thing was in workplace. Has anybody used the Gallup Q12 for uh, workplace engagement? So that's one of the most widely used tools for workplace engagement um, is the Q12. And we've seen a 9% increase in engagement. Um, the scorecards, the scorecards um, on the five stores, they were the highest performing stores in the whole of Australia. Um, engagement um, was, uh, increased significantly. Um, they didn't have a single work cover claim. They actually got called up by the work cover people thinking that something was wrong because they didn't have a single work cover claim in that time, right? So there were lots of big impacts um, through the store. So I just want to talk about the stories. Could you guys just play the video? There's a video that's going to last about six minutes, but I think it's worthwhile um, watching and listening to this. Starting the program, the two-day workshop, learnt so much. Um, learning all the science behind everything was really, really useful for me. It kind of made it click and sink in. The way that everything sunk in was just incredible for me. You get all your blood tests done, you, all the meetings, you communicate with other people what problems they've had, what you could achieve from them. Um, I've changed my eating habits, healthy choices. Today I've lost 15 kilos, which is probably the biggest weight loss I've ever had, so it just everything I've learned has worked for me. In the terms of weight loss, I've lost nine and a half kilos and 16 centimetres from around my middle. 
I've actually lost six centimetres off my girth, which is pretty good. My BP has, uh, blood pressure has reduced from um, high down to normal. 11 kilos, which I'm pretty proud, and 21 centimetres, which is... I've been overweight and suffered depression for over 20 years, and I've tried numerous things, but nothing's ever lasted. Some things have worked, but it's never lasted. So when the opportunity came up to join this program, um, I jumped at it, and I haven't looked back. I've lost 18 kilos and 17 off me stomach, waist. So yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with that. But yeah, weight's not going to be a big thing in my mind anymore. It's more the image I have of myself. Something that I've suffered with is anxiety and stress, and that's kind of just floated away, really. The most important thing that's worked for me is that I no longer take antidepressants, which I'd been on for probably seven years or so, and I don't take them at all anymore. The good thing about this program is getting the confidence back. And like, I've lost nearly 25 kilos since it started, and you start noticing the difference, and you actually want to meet people again. And I've gone back to cricket, which has opened up social networks again, and we're finding we're making new friends and actually going out and being part of society again, which has been the biggest win. I would sleep maybe three, four hours a night, and, uh, and I'd toss and turn. Um, I'm now up to seven hours a night sleep. I've had so many comments of, of people just saying to me, oh, you're looking really well, you know, what are you doing? And, you know, I'd tell them that I'm doing the program. And I've learnt so much and achieved so much in the last 13 weeks that my life will never be the same again. Like, I'm happier. I'm a lot happier, that's for sure. I, I will go into work now and I'll be full of energy, whereas before I'd just sort of do my job and leave, and that was it. Now I'm bouncing around the store, interacting with customers. The enthusiasm and the level of energy at work has probably surprised me. I'm better able to look for the silver lining. I'm better able to um, organise my thoughts. Stomach size from 106 down to 98. Um, I'm feeling better in myself. I'm getting more active again. I said I've given up smoking. I haven't had one for five weeks. Gotten back into my meditation, which is also helping with me to depression. I've now taken up meditation, which has changed my perspective. It's a, allowed me to have an inner calm and uh, and deal with people a lot better um, and, and situations. Of course, my depression, that's the really big change. and I haven't had to have any time off work. Um, um, and I can move on quicker from the little things that distract me. It's just changed my well-being, but also understanding that, that short-term stress, how much of a physical issue it was putting on my body and how, how my, it was affecting to my, my weight gain on the way my body was. And that, that's been my biggest change. I mean, I've cut out bread and stuff like that, but that to me was, was the hugest change in making me feel better. And so many people have said that my demeanor has, has totally changed. I'm a lot more relaxed person and it just flows on so many other things in life. Loving life again and enjoying the opportunity that I've had and try and make the most of it and continue on. I've tried a lot of new things that I would never would have tried before. I'm now doing uh, classes at the gym and PT sessions and I did the Zoomathon that we had here a couple of weeks ago. No way on earth I would have tried that two months ago. Just basically living life. The whole program has been fantastic. It's, um, I feel like I've got so much more energy. I've lost weight. Um, I'm 20 centimetres down on my waist which is huge. I think it's been a sensational um, journey that we started. Um, and just looking forward to yeah, continuing the healthy lifestyle and influencing others. So thank you for the opportunity. It's been sensational. The whole, whole thing about the whole program's been completely motivating and, and just inspirational. So I'd like to thank you personally for everything you've done for me and my family. I've got a lack of stress and just a, a far better outlook on life in general. So um, thank you very much to Woolies for, for allowing this program to come to us um, and for you, Paul. Um, this is truly life changing and, uh, and I can't be appreciative enough of this opportunity. Sure as hell we'll remember what you've done and yeah, you've given our lives back and Woolies, as you say, you invest a lot in us and this has been your biggest investment in me, like you've given me the energy to work again. I love everything about this program but I remember Paul asking us one time what was our why and it was only last week that I found my why, yeah, and I wrote it down and it was to live a long, happy, healthy life. And I am doing that now. And I am forever grateful to you, to Woolworths, to everybody here, to, my to everybody, because I have, 
I've changed everything. Sorry. And I'm really, really happy and thank you so much. I mean, I know you kind of see the human element, but the, the, the big thing for me is treating the whole person um, and, and, and integrating both the physical and the mental into the workplace and, and how that can impact on workplace uh, productivity, but also in terms of work, workplace um, health and safety, in terms of that whole presentism link. Because when people feel good about themselves, when they're healthier, their brains are sharper, they're more switched on, they're more integrated into their workplace, they're more engaged with others, and that can only have a positive impact on the whole workplace um, in terms of um, health, well-being, and safety. So let me just, sorry, get to the point where... Um, the other thing, oh, sorry, one slide that I didn't connect in, um, let me just blank that out, is the, we also did psychological measures. So there's something called PSYCAP, uh, um, which is um, being devised by a bunch of psychologists or psychiatrists as well. And it is basically very strong predictor of well-being and particularly relevant to the workplace. So it's broken into four elements, hope, efficacy, self-efficacy, the belief that what I can do makes a difference and I can control things, um, optimism and resilience. Uh, on all four elements of PSYCAP, they improved anywhere between 10 and 15% which is very significant. So that for me is the interesting thing, the link between the physical and the psychological. And you heard the guys talking about self-esteem, um, their view of themselves, all of these sorts of things. So it really does lead, I think, to, uh, I'm banging the drum of having an integrated approach to health and well-being. And I would also like to bang the drum of having an integrated approach to health and safety that the health and the safety have to be thought of as together, not two separate things. And um, the last bit I, I just want to focus on is this little thing. Am I over time or am I still got a couple of minutes? Oh, we, we started over time. Yeah, okay. I, thought, I think I've still got a few minutes by my timer. Um, and it's just about the influence on other people, right? So this was done looking at research done in the States on, on the town of Framingham, right? So they had about 40,000 people who've been studied over 30, 40 years. This is how we know the stuff that is linked to heart attacks, because they studied these people, they had health checks every six months, they tracked their diet, they tracked their blood pressure, their weight, their cholesterol, their blood glucose, um, how many friends they had, uh, and their social status, how much money they earned, all of these sorts of things. The most, it's, it's the most data we've ever collected on a town. Uh, and that came out the Framingham Heart Study, which some people may have heard of. However, these two um, Harvard professors went back and they looked at the data um, through the lens of obesity. And they did a very clever thing. They took 2,200 people who were connected in a social network. So for those of you who can see it, every dot in here is a person. Um, and they're all connected socially. A yellow dot is an obese individual. A green dot is a non-obese individual, right? A blue line is a family tie or a marriage. And a red line is, uh, is uh, sorry, a blue line is a family tie. A red line is a marriage or a friendship. So they separated out genetics from friendships, from non-blood ties. But the cool thing they did, they didn't just look at who hung out with who, because as you look at it, you can see the yellow dots tend to cluster with the yellow dots. So overweight people tend to hang with overweight people. But what they looked at was rate of change over time. And what they found is that this applies to us all. If in the next six months, one of your friends becomes obese and you're not obese now, your chance of becoming obese yourself goes up 52%. If in that time period, two of your friends become obese, your chance of becoming obese goes up 174%, right? And that is the whole social network side of things. Now, they've also looked at happiness as well in the same cohort of people. And they found if you have a happy friend, your chances of being happy yourself goes up 15%. A happy friend of a friend who you do not know increases your chance of being happy by about 9.5%. And a happy friend of a friend of a friend who you don't know increases your chance of being happy by about 5.5%, whereas a $10,000 raise will increase your chance of being happy by about 2%. Right? The point of this is the power of social networks. We are tribal, right? We are heavily influenced by those in our social networks. Now, what they showed is 
these social networks had to be people who you were in contact with. So they had to live within two kilometers and you're in reasonable contact with them, right? That connection, face-to-face connection, is a huge driver of human behavior. And that's the kind of thing that I want to leave on, is about what events like this can do if you take advantage of it. Um, The guys who are putting this event up are giving you guys the whole infrastructure so that you can leverage off all the stuff that they've done and all the stuff that everybody else is doing to really optimize your culture of workplace health and safety. But I'm going to leave you with bad news, right? Keynote speakers all around the world will leave you with a positive emotion, but I'm not a motivational speaker, right? I'm a realist. And the realist in me tells me I need to leave you with the bad news. And the bad news is that no one is coming. Seriously. Nobody. Nobody is coming to sort your shit out. They're just not. Nobody is coming to make your workplace in this context a workplace that has a really good culture of of a well-being and safety. So you guys have got all of the infrastructure, all of the connections that you need right here to do something about your culture, but it's up to you to do something. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Paul. That's fantastic. I hope everyone's feeling happy. Are you? Yeah. Isn't it amazing the Irish are the only people who, uh, that, that wonderful accent that can get away with saying shit and not um, offending anyone? Um, Paul has indicated that uh, he's happy to have one or two questions. So if anyone would, has a question, if you'd like to uh, perhaps raise your hand. Any questions? Paul. Yeah. You said you're doing a PhD at the University of Tasmania? Yes. What's the topic? Uh, public health. So it, it's this whole thing, and it's with the medical department. Fantastic. Fo- uh, it's focusing on just that study that I just showed you. Um, so it's going to be looking at the impact of lifestyle on, on physical health, but also psychological health. Great. Thank you. Thank you. There's somebody else. Yeah, that accent would have to be Scottish, wouldn't it? Uh, no, it's Northern Irish, actually. Northern? Is that right? It's all right. You didn't say English. If you'd have said English, I was yeah, going to throw this at you. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, I did. You've obviously got an ear. I spent five years living in Scotland. Yeah, it's the security influence or something. Yeah. Else. Um, with regard to that study, you were saying that the, with Woolworths and all the people were coming out saying how remarkable it was, um, it reminded me a little bit of that Jenny Craig now, <laughs> now um, uh, uh, you obviously did a whole of person and then instead mm. of just concentrating on weight. Yeah. And um, that is that probably why that Jenny Craig's is doesn't really sustain. Yeah. Look, 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 I mean, there's good things about Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers and stuff like that. There, there's good things, and then there's not so good things. So I'm interested in long-term behaviour change, right? So we track those guys six months later. Nobody's put on any weight. Okay. Which is is very unusual. Uh, and the whole thing is about self-determination to help them ba- basically teach them how to fish rather than constantly giving them fish. So something like Jenny Craig often can become a bit of a crutch, right? That when they leave that, everything falls apart. Yep. So, but the good bits are the social support. If you look at the Weight Watchers of Jenny Craig, it's that social support that's really important. And we were very strong on connecting these guys together in groups. So all of us met as a group every uh, four weeks, and, and they reported that it, it kept them accountable to each other, right? So when you're connected with people, um, you have that peer-to-peer accountability. We also then separated them into smaller accountability groups so they help each other through. And, and that, I think, was the, was, was the really important thing, as well as you know, the, the, the big thing for the, a lot of them was the no one's coming, right? I've got to sort out. So we, we helped them finding why it's important for them, you know, that whole purpose thing, think about that marathon thing. So I, I think it's, it, it's looking at all of the behavioral science and saying what does actually work, and part, a huge part of it is that social connectedness, um, which is, you know, why events like this are great too. Okay. Um, one quick question. 
How do you motivate? Fit, how, See, this is the thing, you can't motivate other people unless you're going to be there to be a trainer. Uh, I'm a big fan of helping them find the reasons why it's important to them, right? That is what good coaches do, is they help people to discover that, and then they give them tools to support that. Does that make sense? Okay. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Paul. <laughs>